but it's about healing, creating, and writing. And it's all, you know, it's Julia Cameron, who all of you who write love, and Sark, who all of you who Sark love. And um, anyway, so she was going to be able to um, mention that in her introduction. Anyway, <laughs> hi. <laughs> I, is this on, by the way? Working in the back? I, it feels like I'm not, it feels not good to me talking because I have, I'm an old teacher and mother of four, so I'm used to saying get over here right now. Um, <laughs> I'm Elaine Petricelli, and it's my honor to give this introduction tonight. So before I start, I want to start with the uh, writing retreat that Annie was mentioning. It's October 29th to 30th, and it is at College of Marin, and I know there's some early bird sign-up things and it's called Heal and Create. So if you go to the Book Passage website by tomorrow, you'll be able to sign up. And I th uh, okay, thank you. And you want to go. It's, it's, it is limited for in-person, but Reese, I believe we are doing it also online. So there'll be, if you uh, know somebody who can't be there or who can't get in because it's going to fill, I go back a long way with our interviewer today, Ann Lamont. Uh, I was uh, telling Mark that we met on the phone. I opened my first store in 1976, and my one favorite book, my first months in office, in office, in, <laughs> uh, uh, in book selling, was Hard Laughter. I loved Hard Laughter. If only I could have sold as many books. Uh, as of that as everything else in the store. Uh, but there weren't any. The publisher said they were out of stock, and I didn't know what to do. And because I wasn't trained as a bookseller, I didn't know that it was not okay to call the author directly. <laughs> so I looked in that wonderful uh, database called the phone book, and there was Annie's name, and I called her up, and uh, we realized that the publisher actually did have books, and um, we, uh, I made a deal. And <laughs> they had remaindered them, and they would only sell them to me at 50 cents a book. And I think it was $15 for a hardback then, or maybe less, I don't know. But anyway, we I bought them all, all 2,000, and uh, I sent the check at this will tell you a little bit about publishing. Sorry, Wendy. Uh, I sent the check in January, and the books did not arrive until June. But And some of them were missing. I think we got not quite 1500 but that was okay, because if they cost 57 cents, that was okay, too. And then we sold them, and I split the money with Annie, and uh, <laughs> I was so happy. So... That's how we started our relationship. She has been teaching for us at Book Passage for many, many years. She started teaching over 30 years ago when Sam was, uh, even before, when Sam was an infant and my job was to hold him. And uh, so, and now she teaches once a year for one day in May. So watch our website and you can be here too. Uh, but I am... Um, Every book that Annie writes is an event here at Book Passage, not only because we have an event, but because it's so exciting to be able to sell Annie's books. So thank you, Annie, for all of them and for being, uh, when COVID hit, Annie was determined that we would survive and she started a GoFundMe page and uh, she was trying to teach me to be a fundraiser and I was a really bad fundraiser, but she raised a bunch of money anyway. <laughs> uh, and Mark, I am so glad, Annie, thank you for introducing Mark Iaconelli to me. This man is such a treasure in this world. And his book, Between the Listening and the Telling, which I believe is your so he's not exactly a newbie, but he was for me. I am not just him for the other book. And I just fell in love with this book. I'm, as you can see, as I was reading, I kept putting post-its on it. <laughs> and to the point where my husband said, you're going to have so many post-its, you're not going to be able to do the introduction because 
it wouldn't mean reading the book. But what I can tell you is the foreword by Annie is, of course, magnificent. Uh, and there then at the end, I have to give away something. Uh, Annie did some help editing, and she was a good editor, but she was frank. And at one point, she said to Mark, was this chapter written by you or the Democratic National Committee? <laughs> <laughs> Which is <laughs> vintage Annie. At any rate, uh, Mark's work has been not only in books, but he is an important speaker, and his work's appeared in the Wall Street Journal and on BBC4 and NPR and uh, ABC, and I'm sure I'm missing a few. But this is a book that will really, I, I don't want to say it'll change your life, because I'm sure your life's perfect, <laughs> but it will inspire you to tell stories and talk to people and listen to people. And uh, there are stories in here, like the story of Clara, when I even think about it, Clara, and uh, I cry. I mean, it's so beautiful and yet so heartwarming when you finish. There are very funny scenes, such as when Mark and his team were trying to start the hearth and everything went wrong from the uh, motorcycle guys who didn't want to be there. <coughs> You'll have to read to figure out what Mark did. Brilliant. Um, but uh, last night I went to dinner with two of my cousins, and I hadn't seen them in many years because of COVID, and they live back east. And having just read Mark's book, I decided we're going to tell stories. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we sat down at the dinner table, and I started to prompt them to tell stories, and we ended up telling each other things that we had never told anyone before. Mm -hmm. And so thank you for that. Yeah, it was that. such, uh, the only problem with it was the restaurant finally wanted us to <laughs> leave. <laughs> <laughs> so I am going to turn this over to these two brilliant people, and I hope that all of you are going to find this book as inspiring as I did. Thank you, Elaine. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. You have nice friends. You know this because it stays so well. I know I do. Thank you all for coming. I really do think this book could change your life in the sense that now when things get very complicated and or tricky or devastating, there's an owner's manual for that for for families and for whole communities and um you know, whether it's around the dinner table or whether it's um, in a community where there's been a shooting or a factory closing or whatever, that there is a way to, um, there's a way to come through and be um, blessed and stronger because of this weird collagen and nutrition that we are given when, when we share stories and when we listen. Um, between the listening and the telling. Well, Mark, why don't we start with you telling people about your book. My original first question was, um, this book comes out of your work with story and community. How did you start working with story? No, let's not do that. Let's skip that. Okay. I had such an amazing answer to that I know question. You did. Now I'm gonna tell totally us about now. this book. Just tell us about the book, what these people might be buying later. Well, well, this this book comes out of a life. So sometimes we write books. We have beautiful ideas, and and we, it's a, it's a book that comes from um, thinking about things. This book comes from living things. So it, this is a book of practicing working with communities, communities in trauma, um, communities that are feeling alone, isolated, disconnected, people who are anxious. Um, working with young people after a fire has ravaged a town, working in a town after a school shooting, working with undocumented people who were terrified after Donald Trump was elected and trying to find a way for their voices to be heard. And so, um, so I've had the privilege of doing this work as a volunteer for a long time in Ashland, Oregon, where we started having community gather gatherings that were really based on testimony or confession you know, where local people, we called it real stories from regular folks. I'd gather uh, six people to tell a true story from their own life based on a theme. 
we'd ask for donations at the door, and you'd come in, and you would see the massage therapist, the, the repair guy from Ace Hardware, um, the receptionist from the school, standing up there telling a story on the theme letting go. Maybe they were all telling a story of, of a death they had suffered. And usually what happens in that room is uh, when, you, when someone is willing to give you the gift of opening their heart and telling you what they've lived and, over, and suffered and overcome, <sighs> we all take a breath and the pretending and the personas that we create soften a little bit and it's like humanity breathes in the room and we feel like we can be ourselves a little bit and the shoulders drop and we walk out. And I've felt this happen again and again as people are willing to come up and, and share their lives. You know, and it's, it's really an enormous gift. And so the book, I was trying to capture this experience to remind us of this folk medicine that every human being can do. We can all tell stories. And we, c and we all want to have others feel our, our lived experience. And, and so the book is my attempt at sharing what I've been living up in Ashland with a wider audience. Mm -hmm. You've been on the road for a while. Yeah. A month? No, three weeks? It's been about a month and a half, yeah. Has it been? Yes, with his mother. sainted wife <laughs> yes. in, an, in an RV. <laughs> yes. Um, what has that been like to speak to so many 15 or 16 groups of people? Well, you know, we did. We started by doing libraries, little small town libraries along the Oregon coast, uh -huh. and um, it's amazing how similar everything was. Where people are scared, they're very scared, and we would hear it from the librarians first. You know, librarians who, uh, you know, are are normally been trusted people now feel a lot of mistrust. Mm -hmm. So people coming in to say, "Are you selling these books? Do you have these books? What's your radical agenda?" And these librarians are like, we're just setting up a children's time here, you know, or we want to just help right. you, this kind of thing. Right. And so they don't know what to do. And, and what's coming at them is a lot of anger, and people feel uh, violence at the edges of their community. It, they can feel it there. So a lot of people coming to these uh, book readings are sort of desperate. Like, do you have anything that could help? Like, if you got anything, please give it to us because we don't know what to do right now. That's been a real surprise, and it's um, sa it's sad, and and then you know, I try to I talk a little bit, but and and maybe we're not going to do it here, sadly. But I get them telling stories, mm -hmm. and as soon as they start feeling each other's humanity and feel a little less alone and hear each other, <sighs> okay, you know, I'm not alone. Okay, let's hold hands. We're all in this little town together and we have a conversation about what might be possible. And so it gets a little better, but it's hard out there is what mostly what I'm experiencing. Well, in terms of the healing of the soul, we, we might dare to call the soul, and the spirit, what is the mechanism of a, sto of a story com guild or a community or an evening even? How does that lead to healing? Um, well, I mean, there's a couple things. You know, some, I, mean, I feel like first thing, I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things out there. But, but what I m suspect, some of the things that happen are, one is, if if you ask me a question like, um, what was it like growing up with your parents, uh -huh. and you mean it, yeah, and you're gonna, and you got all the time in the world for me, and you're mm -hmm. curious, and you're gonna listen to me, and and you give me that gift, and suddenly the story starts to come out between us and in a way that maybe I'm listening to it too mm -hmm. as I'm telling it. Mm -hmm. What can happen is I can locate myself. Oh, here I am. Here I am. You know, I've been out here. I've been scattered in 15 different ways, but it's an integration kind of experience. I get to tell my story and then you listening and mirroring. When my eyes get tearful, I notice yours get tearful. When I start laughing, you start laughing. And, and what happens is an, an attunement. You, you sort of calm my body, you hold that story, and I come home to myself. So, so it, one way it, it brings healing is just like, oh, here I am. Mm -hmm. I haven't felt myself in a long time. And, mm -hmm. and my guess is if I tell the story honestly, and you're a friend, I'm gonna sense some compassion from you or some ways in which you're, you're, you're trusting me and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so that 
invites me maybe to do the same. So the, so the listener gifts me in that way and I feel connected and mm -hmm. less alone. Mm -hmm. So it comes by coming home, it comes by feeling connected mm -hmm. to others. Mm -hmm. and there are other things that happen too, I think, in that magic. What I love about it is anybody can do this. You don't have to go to therapy you know, and pay a lot of money. We could all ask good questions and listen to one another, mm -hmm. and it works. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I did a project, kids in this one school, a third of them had lost their homes in fires in Southern Oregon. And the state asked me, could you go into these schools and use story to help bring some healing around? They, they had hired counselors for these schools, but most of the kids weren't going to the counselors or didn't trust the counselors, and, and, or they would go once and that's it. So they said, could you use story as a, you know, like most things with young people, as a trick. Could you trick them into <laughs> healing using stories? So we put them in small groups and we had to hire a therapist because of lawsuits and lawyers. You know, we had to have a therapist in the room observing to make sure we weren't doing anything wrong. This therapist uh, was Native American and she came in, she watched us put kids in circles. We asked kids to tell stories, first fun stories and stories about strange encounters with animals and places they loved when they were young, and then harder stories. And when we were done, the therapist said, um, oh, I don't need to come anymore. Everybody's going to be fine. And I said, well, they want you here. No, 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 they're going to be fine. Why? Well, you have them in circles. And as long as you have them in circles, uh, and one uh -huh. gets to tell, and the others listen, and the next tells, and you've got a good rhythm where everybody's getting the same amount of time to tell, they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. They don't need therapists. They mm -hmm. just need each other and to talk. You know, mm -hmm. you know this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you a question, but I don't want them to hear. So I want you to hear how he I, tells I've the story. I've had a request from someone. Someone put five dollars <laughs> in the piano and has asked for a song. <laughs> this is my. This is a story from the book. I was going to ask him to do a reading right now, but I'd rather. Did he tell you my favorite story? Okay, so, so um, yeah, I have to l upload this one for a second. So there's a man who changed my life. I was suffering and struggling when I was in my 20s. I um, went on a retreat that, that I was tricked into going, and uh, it was a contemplative retreat, and the teacher there was a man named Morton Kelsey, and Morton Kelsey was an Episcopal priest, um, he was also a union therapist and knows who Morton is. And, and he, um, I went on this retreat. I had a powerful experience of, I thought it was a breakdown. I later ling claimed it as an experience of God because of, the, because of Morton listening to me and saying, well, you're not freaking out. Well, you seem calm. Okay. And we bec he became kind of a spiritual mentor. And when he would fly into San Francisco, I was at San Francisco Theological Seminary. When he would fly in, I was hit to be his companion. He was in his uh, 70s, I think, at that time. And I would take him around to different retreats. And when he went to retreats, he would um, demand whatever the conference was or whatever. Um, you had to start with life stories. Everybody there had to get in small groups, and everybody had 30 minutes to tell their life story. And some people didn't agree with this practice, but he was rigid about this that this would change everything if people could tell their stories. And he would start it by telling his life story. And it was a terrible story. It was, grew up in, <laughs> you know, it was Palmer, Palmerton, uh, Pennsylvania is where he's born. His da it's a mining town. His dad's in charge of the mining town. Mm. And he was born premature, what they called, he would say, a blue baby. Mm -hmm. No fingernails, very small. Later, mm. when he got older, he read letters from his mom and in the letters, his mother had written to her sister and said, I've given birth to a monster. Mm -hmm. And he then, in her letters and in talking to other family members, she didn't want the baby when he was born. Uh, she thought he was going to die, and she didn't want to uh, attach to this child. She was forced to by the doctor and, and by uh, his, his father. And um, so as soon as she was able, she stopped, she, she weaned him, they had a little house in the back, what they called a mother-in-law, and he was placed in that house, and they hired a 16-year-old girl in the mining town to take care of him. And so he was there for uh, three or four years. They thought, as he got older, that he was disabled, 
And so they sent him away to a, uh, you know, home for developmentally disabled kids. He was in that home for a couple of years. When they discovered that it wasn't that he was disabled, he had a hearing problem. And so they operated on his ears, opened his ears, he came home, and for the first time he was welcomed into the house at like six years old, seven years old, right? So you know what that kind of pain can, does to a human being. And when he was in his young 20s, he went up into the Allegheny Mountains, and uh, just the pain, the self-hatred, the disconnection was too much. He brought a rifle, and he planned to end his life. And he stayed up there on the mountain, uh, waited until midnight, stars came out, and he's getting the courage to do this, when all of a sudden, he started, he heard a song. And he said, it wasn't through my ears, it was through everything. Through everything that I am, I heard this like a lullaby. And I felt such a wash of love that I couldn't go through with ending my life. And I, and I came down the mountain. The story from there is he, he goes to a church and says, is there a God? You know, I don't know anything about this. And, and he, that's his spiritual journey. So he would tell this story send everybody off to tell their stories, right? And I heard him tell this many times. And then um, he, one time I pick him up down here at the San Francisco airport, and I'm taking him to the seminary, and he says, Mark, you're not going to believe what happened. I said, what happened? He said, I get a letter. Now, he wrote about 30 books, and he would get these letters. He said, I got a letter from someone who said, did you ever live in Pennsylvania by any chance? You know, I just read your book, and Yes, I did, and he ended up sending them. Uh, he's, uh, I'm glad you enjoyed the book. Here's my latest book. It was a book of Native American folk tales. And she wrote back and said, uh, I know those tales because I'm the one who told them to you. My name is Clara. When I was 16 years old, your parents hired me to take care of you in, in this little house in the back of their home. I have been looking for you my whole life. Mm. And I saw this book, and I was hoping it was you. Would you please come and visit with me? Morton tells me the story. We do the event. I take him back to the airport. And about two months later, I go down to visit him in San Diego where he lived. And I remember uh, sitting in their living room. He was with his wife, uh, Barbara. He couldn't speak when I asked about the story. And so Barbara, his wife, told me. She said, we flew out. We go to this little house. Here where, is this, where is it? this is in Palmerton, Pennsylvania. She was okay. still there. The woman mm -hmm. was still there. Mm -hmm. She was a librarian, mm -hmm. and, uh, or had been a librarian. She was in her 90s, right? Morton is in his mid-70s at this point. And um, she's, Barbara says, well, this little woman meets at the door, super bright, all her faculties, hugs them, comes in, and says, I want you to know, you know your parents hired me to take care of you, and I thought, I am the luckiest girl in this whole town. They had a crib for you. You never slept in that crib. You always slept in the bed next to me. And I would sing songs to you. And as you got older, I told stories to you. And I always knew you were smart. I always knew you were intelligent. We would play games. And uh, I would tell stories. And, and I just felt like the luckiest person. I was never able to have children on my own. So I've always wondered, what happened to that little magical boy who I loved? She says, and I want to hear about your life. So for the whole week, they tell each other the stories back and forth, what their lives had been like. And they go to leave, and um, she hugs him. And as she hugs him, she starts singing a song. And it's the same song that had come to him in his early 20s when he was about to end his life, that song of love. And so that was Morton. <laughs> that story's in there. Yeah. I remember when you told me that, you said, I'll tell you, but you can't steal it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I remember telling that story and noticing you were taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I love that story. Um, there's something true in it, isn't there? There's something so true in it that has to do with things being outside of time and distance and the visible world and that has to do with something that when your parent or when the world or your parents had nothing to offer, you were held. And, and having been held, you were um, able to grow. And having been able to grow, you were being able to come into um, a kind of wellness that would give you the opportunity to explore 
the huge questions and the huger realities, and it was all on this invisible plane of things we didn't remember. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I didn't explain it very well, but... Um, well, uh, yeah, because, um, you know, he was telling a story, yeah, but it wasn't the deeper story, right? right? He didn't know the story that she was there. Yeah. And uh, so he was telling the story of, oh, I had this very sad, awful childhood. Yeah. But that wasn't the whole thing. Uh-uh. No, yeah. that wasn't the it whole was thing. It was the underwebbing. The underwebbing, yeah. Um, so your book emphasizes listening, between the listening and the telling. Uh, how do you get people to learn to listen? Well, th- so that's, that's why listening is mentioned first, because stories... Uh, quickly die if there isn't anyone listening so sometimes i you know i have to trick or force people into listening so like if Mm -hmm. i get them in small groups it's like okay i did a thing yesterday in in uh san anselmo we had a group of us met under a cypress tree and i asked them to remember an encounter with beauty this last week so everybody thought for a minute and i put them in groups and then i said um one person's going to tell you their encounter with beauty and the other three people you can only listen you can't ask any questions like wait a minute was that in Oklahoma or was that in Nebraska you can't comment you can't say oh I have two sisters you just have to listen and then when the three minutes are up the next person so you know yeah sometimes people will sit there like okay when is this over but Mm -hmm. mostly it's like I can't say anything I might as well listen (laughs) and so Uh and then they might get um, seduced by the Mm -hmm. experience of someone else and mm-hmm. it happens. So that's how it begins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It over and over and over again is about whether the telling or the listening um, is going on right then. It's about it decreasing that crippling sheet metal sense of isolation mm-hmm. that we all have suffered, that we all know, that we've all been through. Um, you write in the book, we tell stories to keep our souls intact when suffering, suffering overtakes us. And we've uh, been talking about that already, but how does um, forming the story, you need to, when you tell a story, you need to start somewhere horribly. And you know, it's funny because when people ask how I became a writer, um, it, my dad was a writer, so I learned the habit. But um, when something happened on the blacktop, um, something dramatic like that, like J.B. Halpern stole Vicky's lunch or something like that, or J.B. forgot his, or something, I could always, I always had the courage to just, because pl- they came to me to tell the, the other kids came to me to tell the story of what had happened because I could be trusted to just kind of plunge in. And I'd say, okay. So we all got out for lunch and we didn't notice that J.B. Halpern had forgotten his lunch. We didn't know that. And then, all, you know, but I would always have a place to start. And then if you tell stories midway through, your mind is working ahead of you. And it's kind of getting you to what would be the organic ending where you, the listener, and you yourself are going to step out of the, uh, the far side of the pond into which you stepped. And, um, and you just kind of, it's funny because it's inconvenient that it works that way, but you all of a sudden often know the ending that you're going to tell towards. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, yeah, well, and, and I get to do that work, you know, so just doing these events, I ended up stumbling into this work as a story catcher, and that's uh, a term that was given to me by an Irish writer who says, oh, yeah, you know, in the villages, and the, we used to have story catchers who would gather the stories and then s- tell them back to the community when they needed them. And he would tell me, like, sometimes the story catcher would would hear a story and they would hold it their whole life knowing there's only going to be one time this is told mm. and I'm waiting for it and now's the time and mm-hmm. so now you tell it uh-huh. and so I've gotten that privilege and, you'll, and you know people come and they they kind of spill out their experience you know, like I'll have somebody saying well I just did a thing called with frontline stories and so I had people who work in ICU saying people need to hear our story they're compelled you need to know what's going on and people need to know what's going on in these hospitals mm-hmm. why we wear masks and why we mm-hmm. do all this I want to tell my story but they, you know, you were the story catcher. They don't, they don't quite know how to do it. So they're telling the middle first, and mm-hmm. or, and, and they're spilling it out like like a, like a box of photographs. Mm-hmm. But then you think, okay, well, this one maybe goes first, and this mm-hmm. one second, and you kind of you kind of help mm-hmm. it out. Mm-hmm. But what I've learned is, and you mentioned the soul, the soul wants to be heard, mm-hmm. and the soul speaks in images, and the soul speaks in stories, 
And if you are patient, it'll appear before you like staring at those those puzzle images where you have to yeah. stare at and the 3D image comes yeah, out. Yeah. You kind of have to stare at it for a while and listen and be patient. And then the soul will, will appear the story before you. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, why don't you just read something from <laughs> um, the book and tell it, yeah. Okay. I, I, there's two things I didn't say. One is I think, I think my daughter's watching on, on um, this oh live stream, cool. and, she, and she said, whatever you do, don't bring shame to the family. <laughs> so That sounds right. And Annie's <laughs> trying to help me here. <laughs> okay, this is, this, is where, this is the beginning of the book, chapter one. There are moments, often unexpected, when you find yourself at home in your own life. Simple, gentle, ordinary moments. Standing at the kitchen window, rain outside, the earth springing into green and yellow, the birds, the ridiculous birds, singing without worry beneath the gray sky. For some reason, without effort, the anxiety lifts, your chest relaxes, your senses awaken, a quiet descends, and you're home. It's in moments like this when I can feel how distant I have been from the life I long to live. I've been homesick and didn't know it. I've been living miles away from my deepest yearnings and not known it. I've been hurrying through my days, isolated, fragmented, caught within the jet stream of the anxious world. And only now, in the waking stupor, do I feel the alienation and loss and, like a sobering drunk, ask, how long was I out? Mm. Months is the reply. Other times, years. I used to sometimes sense in conversations with friends in the movies, books, and stories we consumed an unspoken longing for some kind of great disruption, a disaster, an upheaval, some systemic breakdown. It was a fantasy, of course, but one that revealed a kind of helpless despair at the lives we find ourselves compelled to live. It came from an unconscious understanding that our way of life was destructive and unsustainable, dishonest and unsatisfying, a longing for a reckoning and repentance, a longing for limits, for an adult in the room to say, okay, that's enough. It was a longing for someone to end the tyranny of our every impulse, a longing that we might come to our senses, to our neighbors, to our own basic needs and gifts. And then the world stopped. The pandemic hit, and we were effectively put under house arrest. Masked and hand sanitized, we peered with suspicion behind locked doors at the mail carrier, the old couple walking their dog far too casually, our own mother returning a casserole dish. Step back, mother. Don't touch the doorknob. Just leave it on the doorstep, mother. <laughs> The Grim Reaper chillingly made its way through the human population, compelling all of us to not only withdraw from public spaces, but also to reflect inwardly. What is the meaning of life? What matters? Why am I living this way? Why have I wasted so much time? Can I go a little bit further? Yeah. Okay. Several years ago, I spent six months living and working in northern Wales. It's a rural ancient land layered in stories and history, and the Welsh people have struggled and suffered to keep their language, and through that language, a connection to the past, to their ancestors, to the land itself. Within that language, there's a sacred Welsh word, a word, the Welsh tell me, that doesn't quite translate into English. The word is hiraith. A wise friend from that land once told me the word refers to a particular kind of longing. What kind of longing, I asked. He paused, trying to find the words. It's a longing for a place or a time that the soul once knew. Oh. Keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Can I take you on the road and you would just do the sound effects? Yeah. Sigh, make notes. Okay. My son, Noah, was living in London. He was studying acting, living in an apartment with a handful of American students from across the United States. I called and asked how he was getting along with his roommates. He told me it wasn't easy to connect to the other students because they spent much of their time by themselves, on their phones, on social media. When they did socialize with one another, it often involved heavy drinking. Then mm -hmm. he said, they are all full of longing, but they don't know what they're longing for. They don't even know they're longing. He could have been describing most of us in the West, overwhelmed, estranged from our lives, out of touch with our inner vitality, we often find ourselves entranced by activities we know are empty and damaging. We are longing, but don't know why. We are yearning for a life we once knew, 
but we can't seem to remember where we left it. Two weeks later, I called Noah, asked how it was going. He told me he had invited his roommates to go with him to a farmer's market. Together, they bought chicken and vegetables, apples, lemons, and fresh herbs. They spent the rest of the day cooking a fall soup, garlic potatoes, beet salad, roast chicken with rosemary and lemon, apples baked in butter and cinnamon. Eager to share the feast they had made, Noah and his roommates called the students from the apartment next door and invited them over. They lit candles, gathered leaves and flowers for the table, and when the guests arrived, Noah asked everyone to set their phones aside. We took our time, he told me. We sat at the table for hours just talking, telling stories about our families, the towns we grew up in, our hopes for the future. He paused. We sat late into the night until early morning, just talking. Everyone was so tired, but no one wanted to leave. Although he didn't say it, my guess is that around that table, the longing momentarily ceased, the emptiness filled, the anxiety calmed. Within those hours rich with story and laughter and human warmth, eight university students found home. What does it mean to be human? How are we to spend our days? How do we face the troubles of this world? How do we address the heartache with a life we're meant to live but can't remember how? How do we find the place that the soul once knew? Mm. I love that, Mark. Um, we're going to leave time for questions, but I'd, I just have a couple more of my own. Um, so is there a dark side to story? Don't Buddhists and therapists talk about getting trapped within stories? And also, is... Uh, no... No, uh, they don't uh, say that. No, they That's don't. completely wrong. Uh, you know, Pema Shro Chodron, this, yeah. she works down at the Burger King, and she <laughs> says some really amazing things, but she said that's not true. <laughs> okay. But is there a dark side to story yeah. or getting trapped within the stories that we've been telling forever that may not have anything to do with, with anything that ever actually happened? Well, so there's a couple things I experience, and probably there's, there's much wiser people that could talk about this better than I can. But what I notice is, one, sometimes they're trying to evoke something in us by the story, and it's not working. <laughs> you know? uh -huh. So they're telling the story until someone finally says, that sounds really hard. And uh -huh. no one's been saying that. Everybody's been trying to fix them when they tell the story, or everyone focused on uh, the crazy brother in the story. But what they really were hoping for is that someone would say, gosh, that was really hard. Mm -hmm. And then it's like, okay, finally, you know, mm -hmm. I've been telling this, waiting for that response. Sometimes that's it. Other times, yes, we get stuck in certain ruts, maybe like Morton and his story, you know. And so that's why w what I've noticed is people are hoping that you'll ask them questions that knock them out of the rut. Uh -huh. So just even like yesterday, asking yeah. people like, when did you encounter beauty? Uh -huh. People were like, huh, hmm. I think I'll, let me see if I think of anything, you know, just, and I, was, I asked him just for the last two weeks, just mm -hmm. the last two weeks, encounter mm -hmm. with beauty, it could be really small. Then as they started telling the stories, they realized, holy cow, I had a life-changing experience this week. I just didn't notice it. I just skipped over it. You know, mm -hmm. there was an EMT who came to help my mother and mm -hmm. he was so kind and treated her so well, you know. Mm -hmm. So they need other kinds of questions that helps them feel th the wide landscape of their being. Mm -hmm. instead of the tiny little neighborhood that they're staying in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there's a chapter on sacred stories yeah. in the book. And can you talk about the way in which stories, storytelling, communities, writing our stories, all of it are part of the, um, or have the potential to be part of our spiritual journey? <laughs> well, um, these are straight from your book, Mark. Yeah, I guess these, these are just... <laughs> these are not trick questions. I know, but it's just right here, right now. I know. So, well, you know, so every, every wisdom tradition uses story, right? Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a line from Anthony DeMello. You know, Jesus speaks in stories, tells parables all the time. Mm -hmm. And one time the disciples, his followers, go up to him and say, why do you always speak in stories? And Anthony DeMello has him say, well, don't you know that the shortest distance between a human being and the truth is a story? Mm -hmm. And I think when we're trying to convey a truth, we, we move into story, not philosophical principles. Mm -hmm. 
So yes, the sacred is held in story somehow. You know, these, mm-hmm. these full body meaning making mm-hmm. machines that, mm-hmm. that bring us in mm-hmm. and wake our hearts up and our senses up. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, so anytime anybody's telling a story, it's a thin place. Mm-hmm. The sacred is close. You, you know, some of the depths of life, it's possible it could start to permeate mm-hmm. in any story about mm-hmm. finding their lost dog, mm-hmm. you know, or about the kooky things, the way they and their sisters used to dress up at Halloween, you know, mm-hmm. and you're hearing the affection they had for one another. You're hearing their creativity. Y- you're hearing the way, whatever we want, the numinous, the way mm-hmm. God and all shows up in our bodies and in our mm-hmm. experience. So, so story mm-hmm. is always, and when we s- move away from it, we tend to move into that steel room you were talking about of feeling isolated when we when the stories are not told. Mm-hmm. And also when we tell stories, I mean, just watching you, it's all, it's kind of, it's a dance, you know, you're moving your shoulders and you're moving your hands and you kind of want, trying to bring people closer or, you, or you're, you're showing us distances and size and you're showing us something beyond your words. Yes. It, it, so, you know, th- when we, when we speak, the academy has, you know, that's the intellect trying to talk. In therapy, we use emotional language. But when I'm trying to help you feel, this is what it feels like to be me, mm-hmm. you know, I move into story. And the story is my body really trying to speak to your body. I'm trying to yeah. tell you things so you can see the little place in Palmerton and you see the little old lady and you see her dress and you hear mm-hmm. her singing that song to Morton. I want you to see and feel it and hear it uh-huh. so you can feel it. And, uh-huh. and that's our bodies trying to resonate with one another. Yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't mean to laugh when you said that Morton um, <laughs> said it was not a great childhood or, <laughs> or that it was a bad childhood, you know, but for your mother to describe you as a monster yeah. and to get rid of you, in effect. I mean, that in reality, to get rid of you, to give you away because you're just too upsetting for her to have to even come into contact with but so the way that that the alchemy of that childhood turning into the story of turning into the 21 year old who goes to the mountain and something not from this side like tugs on his sleeve and he hears and the jukebox plays and he hears something he was never aware was even part of his growing and it all and it sprang from this Grim, uh, up growing up of um, having been rejected by the mother. Now that's a bad story, but there are thirty of you or whatever here, and a lot of you were rejected by your mother. It wasn't as bad as Morton's. You know, Morton's is a really bad story, but y- uh, some of you know what it was like to be rejected to have the parent really not want you around or because you were annoying, they fought with you or they picked on you or they just sent you off. I mean, the English sent all their kids off to boarding schools, you know. <laughs> and um, and so, I mean, we all, when it comes down to it, have the same story, you know, that we have been scared a lot of our life and that we have been clueless and that we have experienced that existential isolation so when Morton tells you or you tell me or, or I tell Jill my version of that, it's like doing covers of beautiful songs. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you, you can, you, you're doing a cover. It's the same song told in your words, told with your hands, told with your eyes, told with your heart. And, um, but Morton's um, is a beautiful story as a jumping off place if you don't know where to start with your stories, how far back can you go? How far back can you remember that feeling of, oh, I annoy them. Oh, they're unhappy because I'm not doing well enough. They're unhappy because I talk too much. They're unhappy and it's on me. 
You know, you're four, you're five. I know most of you had incredibly happy childhoods with very healthy parents who had gotten <laughs> therapy and the mother had been very involved early imagine on. Imagine a person. In the, <laughs> imagine, so, uh, yeah, and the mother had been involved in, and the par father, too, in early feminism. And so there was equality <laughs> and, and whatnot. But for those of you who weren't, um, it's a great place to start. My writing students said, I'll say, where do you start? Where should I start? I want to write. Where do I start? Tell me a story. Tell me any story. You know, you're going to tell it on paper. Tell me any story. How far back do you remember? Do you remember kindergarten? Shelly and I go back to when we're six years old. We have a we can roll for each other of stories because what we had were um, the animals we can remember. You don't ever, ever forget an animal you had. So we can remember her dog, Ichabod. I can remember the covers of books at her house. I can remember arts and crafts we did at, you know, six. And um, I can remember what they looked like. I can remember, and I, you know, and my fly's probably down. I can't remember anything anymore. <laughs> and I get most of my exercise walking around trying to find things. <laughs> but I can remember the covers from some of the books at her house. I can remember these puppets we made once with bits of cloth and um, beads, you know. So, um, I just think there's kind of one story that we we were born and we were really deeply confused and we longed, longed, longed for something we didn't know we needed and weren't finding or were, and then it stopped. Something happened. That's what a story is. Something happened. Well, what happened? Just start there. What happened? Well, my dad left. All the dads left in 1961. And we grew up in the Tiburon Belvedere Peninsula. All the dads left. It was Playboy. It was you got rid of the cute wife who'd had your babies, and you got the nice, cute, you know, 15-year-old uh, who'd been the nanny. And um, tell me what you remember. Where does it start? What's the very first Christmas you remember? Well, it's not a good one. It wasn't good, because I remember my mom started drinking. And, um, okay, well, then what happened? Well, then it was funny because my aunt came over, and that's all I remember for the rest of that day is m my aunt having kind of seen what was going on and taking me and help I helped her. You know, whatever. It's all there. You just need a starting question. That's one of the reasons this book mm -hmm. is so great. Tell me about what's the first, what's the first holiday? You know, who was your kindergarten teacher? You know, and it's it funny because Shelley and I had different first grade teachers. You had Mrs. Frost, right? Yeah. She had Mrs. Frost, and I had Lila Messer, who comes to these my events here sometimes. Now, see, I can remember the name of Shelley Adams's first grade teacher, and um, and I have no idea where my driver's license is right now. <laughs> you know, I just got a new one. So, um, but I can remember hers was very fancy, and she had the nails. She was like a babe. She was like the women in um, Mad Men. You know, she's beautiful. Remember, she, had, she dyed her hair platinum, and she said it, right? And she was everything the woman of the 50s that, that you were taught to, to desire, to long for. It meant that if you looked like Mrs. Frost, you had arrived, right? And my teacher, who actually made me who I am, Lila Messer had her for first and second grade. She was a hippie on a houseboat in Sausalito, and she dressed hippie, and she brought, the she brought a guitar in. But you know what? And I had kind of an embarrassment because I wanted Mrs. Frost because a lot of the time we just want a mirror in which we look better, right? And, um, and, and, uh, and I had this kind of embarrassment because all the other... Da -da -da -da, she made me who I am she, because she grokked me. She got me when I was, she got me. And I was a strange child and she saw how beautiful I was. She slipped me extra stuff because she knew that I could read stuff that I would get. And she got me so she could get, help me get who I was, you know? And so if I say to you, who was your first grade teacher? You know, it's, it rolls you of that time. And then it rolls you of what your lunches were. You know, and the difference in your lunches, you know, and what a disaster your own lunches were <laughs> and how you couldn't trade them because other people got Wonder Bread and my mother baked this horrible whole wheat bread that you could not trade. But this book is filled with, oh, I'm so sorry, but we've been going on quite long, but um, this book is filled with pla starting off places. You're in a community, there's been a shooting, where do you start? 
And um, do any of you have questions? We have time if you do. We, um, Mark would love, I mean, it's hard to come up with the first one, but yeah, go ahead. Could you hear Neil? Could you hear that question? Okay. How, how do you how do you find questions? You, there's people you want to talk to, but how do you discover the questions? So this is you know so it's it's a creative work to find good questions. You know so partly I'm always looking for good questions. Like when I worked with young people, I finally found this question I loved, which was, what kind of person do you want to become? And that would instead of like what do you want to do? And that would open up all kinds of things. Why well, want to become the kind of person? Same thing. You know you find questions. Sometimes people give you clues. So like I was with a woman uh, at an event a couple days ago and she was like, oh, I live on this farm in Vermont and I have a stone building uh, that I live in and I do these little YouTube videos talking about what it's like to live on a farm in Vermont. Oh, did you grow up in Vermont? No, I grew up in Florida. So now you have questions there, right? Why a stone building? Oh, my dad was from Switzerland. What was it like having a dad from Switzerland? Oh, when I was four years old, I ran away and I found this little stone building in Switzerland and nobody could find me because I went in there and it was so quiet and so silent and I didn't ever want to leave. And then my dad got neighbors and they all went searching for me and they found me in the little stone chapel. Now she didn't know that was connected to where she was now but you know you start to hear things like that. So you, you listen for clues, people will tell you the kind of questions they want to be asked for and then you also collect questions. Like you were saying, what was an animal you loved? I just did a, I did a retreat a few years ago where I asked everybody, Start the story with, when I was young, there was a tree. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I don't know if this is going to work or not. Everybody thought of a tree. <laughs> you know? And then they started telling stories. And, and, the tr and, th and they told the story from the point of perspective of the tree. What, were, what did the tree see? You know? um, what was a place you loved as a kid? But I sometimes start with bas basic things. Where did you grow up? What was that like? Story questions are things like, tell me an experience of what was it like Tell me about a moment when, you know, you're looking for experience, not ideas, you know. We <laughs> took we took a couple of calls. <laughs> yeah, we, we had really fun with the text. Too, yeah, so we did. A, we yeah. canceled one of the orders. <laughs> yeah, and your um, sister's not coming for the holidays, so you can thank us later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there and then there. Well, there's a, cu a couple things you can do. One, one is there are, there are people who sell little boxes of questions, so you can kind of look through those. There's a thing called True Stories. It's just a box of questions. There's another one called Chat Packs. that are, that are You can get those, look, them, look through them. StoryCorps in the Smithsonian online, they list all kinds of questions to evoke stories, and they even kind of say, like, this is for a grandparent. This is for a child. This is for a family. They just list them. They're all there, so you can kind of look through those. Sometimes we've done it where... Uh, we'll have story questions, and you choose it. If you don't like it, you choose a different one where everybody gets a different story. But, yeah, I would think about the kinds of stories that, um, particularly when I'm hearing a lot of people say families can be really divisive. You know, you show up, and, and the virus, you know, is controversial, or politics start to come up. So if you have 
questions that drop us into our experience, and we can feel each other's humanity, and it sort of can, can rescue us from these very small ways of interacting, you know, in, in one part of our brain. But yeah, it, it, I mean, this is now the, the work, right? You got Thanksgiving coming up. What's a question that would be delicious? So I would listen to friendships and conversations, just like you were talking about teachers in, that you loved or something like that. And, you know, so well, that was kind of fun to talk about. Maybe that's a question I'll ask. Or mm -hmm. animals. We all remember the animals, you know, and I would come up with questions like that until I found ones I thought that would kind of be fun to talk about mm -hmm. together, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, you know, I do ones like a special meal where you really connected to people. Maybe it was driving in a car with a college friend eating hamburgers, or maybe it was a holiday, or maybe, it, you know. But tell me about a meal. But what was the tree question again? <laughs> <laughs> there was now a don't tree. steal that. I'm, no, I'm, go I'm writing a book it. called. No, I'm, I'm writing sorry. a book called no. There Was a Tree. So oh, so okay. that's where you yeah, start. No. Yeah, no. I, I just, it was a there. poem, there was a poem about a tree that I read, and I thought, oh, we should, we should, I thought, I'm just going to try this, so I there said. There was a tree. There, once there was a tree. Yeah. When I was yeah, young. Yeah. Then, what right. I did, and I'll just tell right. you this, so there was, um, so you told the perspective from the tree, and then, or no, you told the story from your perspective as a child, and then I had the tree tell the story. Mm -hmm. So we did two uh -huh. different stories, yeah. Uh -huh. There was a little boy. Once there was a little boy, yeah. and then the trees told the story of what they saw. Yeah. And that gave you that kind of generous perspective. Yeah. Yeah. There's a question up here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you work with a lot of vulnerable populations in some way. Yeah. And I am doing that work as well in an individual level, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and the love story is none of it. Mm -hmm. You know? So this is my work, and I'm needing to move on to a new client, a new person, right? How do you help them? Yeah. I'm abandoning them or I have to make a path of closure to that relationship. In other words, it's kind of tricky to cut it down. It's tricky. Yeah. Because you have that experience where you're, you've gotten really intimate with this group, but you have to then move on. And the story is with each They're still in the fear of that kind of thing. Yes. Um, well, so. I don't work in a therapeutic context, which I know is, is often filled with stories. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the context no, no, you're in. I'm a doula, so it's more recent immigrants. Mm. Okay. You're what? A doula. A doula for recent immigrants. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Uh huh. Wow. Yeah. So a lot of the things I learned about listening, and I, ha I have friends here who I did the training with, was in spiritual direction. Spiritual direction is an old practice uh, goes way back into our common Christian history, and it's about trying to be contemplatively present to others, to be as fully present as you can be. And Eugene Peterson, a writer, once said, a great spiritual director knows nothing and doesn't care. And I don't mean, uh, and he didn't mean that in a, in, a, in a, but it's like, I'm not going to take care of you and save you, you know, because mm -hmm. I, I, I can't. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to be as present as I can, as open as I can, and, I, um, and that's the gift. And that's and sometimes in the situations I'm in, that's all I can bring because then I have to go home or go to some other place or I, I can't take care of them. So I have to trust that that's enough, that if the person feels seen and heard and if I can reflect back to them what they're, you know, the thing that's on the tip of their tongue that they're asking me to say back. Mm -hmm. So if you listen real carefully, sometimes people are asking you to say mm -hmm. something back and I try to listen for that and say it. Mm -hmm. And then I have to, I have to trust, because that's all I can do, right? I'm just one small person. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's very, very hard. Mm -hmm. um, what beautiful work you do. Yeah, what wonderful work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is there one more question? Yes, young man. Uh, well, hi. <laughs> uh, so I help high school seniors apply to college. Um, yeah.
because I can personally say from last year, freshman night, um, I think with a lot of different students, uh, and I, I'm okay with you know, the counseling and asking questions and not saying your name or whatever, but um, being so content that they can be tolerated and just wondering how you all as like communicators and you know, young, young people, I don't know, do you like have mechanisms for being like, hey, we're gonna see how you are now, or hey, let's like kind of have a slow down and like, all right, you're <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I worked with young, I was a youth worker for a long time, I worked with young people, and so, you know, young people are coming out of childhood, and what's, what's the language of childhood is play, you know, that's how relationships are developed, we play together, we make things up, and all that kind of stuff, so that's still hanging around among teenagers, you said you work with teenagers, and so, um, uh, I, I always felt like, yes, some, somehow we've got to come up with some way to play, I mean, I just saw Sam walk in the room here, and Sam was in in a uh, in a Sunday school class I was in, and and it was very serious sometimes, and, and and he was bored, and I was bored, and so sometimes we would, you know, I would look around the room, and I did I didn't bring anything fun, but then I would I think one time I saw yogurt cups, and I thought well we could do something with these yogurt cups, and so let's get a, let's wad up a piece of paper, and we'll try to catch them in the cups, and we'll run around. <laughs> Same thing happens when I'm traveling with kids too, you know, it's like okay, let's do uh, two truths and one lie. Everybody has to tell three statements. One of them's a lie. we got to find the lie. So, you know, those kinds of things can actually generate relationship, and then we can move towards... Well, I guess I meant personally. Like personally, do I have any fun? Never. No, <laughs> not me. I just like how, but if, if that makes sense. Yeah. I'm, I was not quite clear on the question, but plus... I don't have to answer it because Jeez. this is not oh my, gosh. This we is heard not all this my problem. But, um, you know, it's just, it's so rare that people just get to talk and don't get cut off that we're, sometimes like my Sunday school kids, it's like when you listen to a little kid tell a movie plot, you know, and they'll start somewhere that doesn't make sense and they'll, they'll say, okay, so... Um, there was a, the guy had had a gun and a dragon, and then okay, so wait, who was the guy? Was it a child? No, well, it doesn't matter. It well, I mean, was it a kid or was it? Well, it doesn't matter. So anyway, so this and and um and sometimes my Sunday school kids will tell stories, and we only have an hour, you know, and so you kind of you um there are there are really nice ways to um if you're a kind of manipulative grown up up to which I am to cut people off. <laughs> And just say, wait, I just, I just want you to cut to the end. What, tell me what happens, you know. And, um, but I don't think that was really your question. But I, um, I think the main thing for me is that when people will listen to me, and I have to tell all the details, and I know I go long, and I do a lot of tangents. And will someone, when somebody will hold space for me to tell something that must be really important to me, because I'm kind of holding you hostage, I'm just so grateful. <laughs> So I don't, and I don't think that answered your question either, but it's a good question, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I could write it, but I can't write now, but also I feel like this is Mark's problem. But is, um, are there any more questions? Okay, in the blue. Mm -hmm. Morton got to reframe his story. You're, I'm right. just saying, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that if we're really good listeners and, and allow someone to explain their story, and not in their own, which is a little hard for me because I want to like, help out the person and get that's not my goal that I'm doing, um, then I think that, like I think you're saying, um, that the person can Yes. And, and being able to tell that story. And very often, I mean, that could go either way, good or bad, those are realizations. But um, I think that my story helps people learn more about themselves. And, um, Which is why we're here. Yeah. yeah. So I just really love, though, that he got to reframe mm -hmm. his story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Still rejected by mom, and that was awful. Right. 
Yeah, well, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, and he actually forgave his mom and 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 reconciled with her to a certain extent mm-hmm. towards the end of his life. You know, so, someone said, you know, I, I, you know, this is a book about stories, and but, you know, Annie just said it, and I think this is why we s- had little moments we've colluded together. You know, the work is always to free the prisoners. You know, we're we're all in the prison system here, and we're all trying to figure out how to break out. And so when I, so it's not really about story. I mean, even though that's the word we use, it's about how do we exchange our experience in a way that the treasures sort of come to the surface or what mm-hmm. matters or, or we map ways out. You know, mm-hmm. where's the tunnel? Where's the air ducts? How do we mm-hmm. get out of this place, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and live a more in, in greater freedom? I feel like what this book does because of the stories that are there from all these people is it will give you hope. I, I just, the, what, hearing people read the book, you just feel hopeful and better when you actually get, when we all get um, naked together emotionally and tell our stories as they really are. We're just like, oh, it's not as scary as I thought. Things aren't as bad as I, th- I thought they were. We can get out of this place. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the, that's the hope. And if it, if it doesn't give you hope, if this book doesn't give you hope at the end of it, you just write this store in name of Anne Lamott, and she will give you your money back. <laughs> I will. I completely will. She will send you $25 I completely will. each person. But also by Morton listening to your story when you believed and possibly were having a mental breakdown, mm-hmm. and he said, you know, you seem, you seem really clear and present to me. You seem like you're doing okay to me. So maybe both things were true. But in him hearing his, your story and telling your story back to you, what he got of it, he gave you a, um, a pathway out of this kind of clenched feeling of I'm having a, a nervous breakdown, I need to go to, and she said, I think you're fine. Why don't yeah. you come to dinner with me? Because, right, then you yeah. started following him around like a little duckling, like yeah. make way for ducklings <laughs> by Morton yeah. Kelsey. <laughs> Yeah. And then it was it was a story where you really were on the precipice. You really were scared to death. And where he said what he, he, he told his story of you to you, and you kind of went and had some dinner. Yes. Right? You ate. Yeah. You were fed. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was sort of like, and I think I tell this a little bit in the book, but I told him my scary story that, I you know, do I need to go to a hospital, and this is what I'm experiencing. and And then he kind of switched it to like, hey, where'd you grow up? Uh-huh. You know, it's like he didn't yeah, answer. Yeah. And then I told a story. Mm-hmm. Then he would tell a story. Uh-huh. And it was like bells across mm-hmm. a village. Right. Where he would, he, would kinda right. K- he would kind of match me in the stories we were telling until I felt heard and mm. seen and my body relaxed. And then I realized he hadn't answered my question. We went to leave. He's like, okay, well, st- like, exactly. Right. He said, let's go have dinner. I said, wait a minute. Do I need to go to a hospital? He was like, no, I think you're okay. You seem okay. You seem pretty relaxed. And uh-huh. Let's yeah. go get something to eat. Yeah. Yeah. The end of most good stories. <laughs> 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 then they all went and got something to eat. Does anybody have a question? Because. Well, what's still open? <laughs> what's still open? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you all so, so much. Yeah. And, and thank you, Annie, for doing this. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. I'm happy to sign her books as well. <laughs> so. Um, so you don't need to have eggs. Okay, yeah. great. Thank you. Um, so <laughs> we have them available to counter. I'm just going to do a little quick hair so that we can set up the table. And we just want to thank you so much for being here yeah. and supporting the book passage. And um, if, as long as you come here and attend our events and, and purchase books, we'll continue to be the um, amazing community resource that we've been for over 40 years. 40 yeah. years. Wow.